Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here at Stand Group. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's my first time at this amazing conference. I really like it so far. Uh, the City Museum was very fun last night. Also, it's a very nice city for the jazz. Mm -hmm. Like uh, That was at the Bistro last night. You can come on Friday and Saturday night. Uh, there's an amazing jazz, jazz set for the, the 20th uh, anniversary for Jazz St. Louis. So, I am Geoffroy Coupri. I work at uh, Clever Cloud on security and quality assurance. So, Clever Cloud is a platform as a service company. Uh, you do a git push, code is deployed, we support almost any language you could, you could use. We have Docker, we have that kind of stuff, we have zero downtime deployments. And amazingly, it does not go down when the North Virginia Amazon data center goes down. So that's useful. So why are we here? Uh, why are we talking about parcels? Well, first, let's, let me talk about a small project that is very dear to me. Uh, maybe you've heard about it. That's the project with the cone. So, VLC Media Player has been, from start, the designed to handle about almost any uh, video and audio format that exists. And that's very powerful as an ID. But with grid power comes grid failure. Like, uh, those are the villains that were reported in uh, 2004 and 2015. So, uh, yeah, MP4 is a very weird format, uh, very ambiguous, very hard to, to code. Uh, there's the MKV demixer in VLC. It's, it's fun but it's because it's a very large piece of code, much larger than MP4, but there are lots less vulnerabilities. I don't know why, but there, there should be some stuff in there, but we don't find it. We can find those kind of vulns with just a fuzzer that will randomly modify a file and try to crash uh, the code. So why do we have those vulnerabilities in a uh, program like VLC Media Player? Well, for three reasons mainly. First, it's developed in C. Well, it's an old software, but most of the libraries that are used in uh, VLC are developed in C, because that's the only way to make them portable and embeddable in almost any software. Uh, most of the parsers are, wrote, are written by hand. And even if we have the most awesome developers, we have, I think. Um, people still make mistakes. And they happen a lot more because the formats in audio and video are very weird. Like every, every format developer has its own ideas about how a format should be, should, be, should be designed and how it should be performant, and they're all wrong. And they don't know how to write documentation. That's that's awful. So we need, we need a solution for this. We need a way to avoid those mistakes, to, to make sure that the, the, the easy way to develop the parser is the safe way. We need a solution that's memory safe, because most of the errors we have are something like double free and overflows here or there, uh, buffer overflow or integer overflows. This, those happens too. Uh, it must be embedded in C. It must talk easily to C code. And uh, the runtime uh, constraint is important because I would have done some Haskell. At one point, I tried to integrate Haskell inside of VLC, and then the, I saw what the, the garbage collector did to the performance that was just crazy. That was not negotiable. And it must be efficient because that's one of the big criteria for developers, and it must handle streaming. So those are lots of issues that you have to handle in, uh, in uh, multimedia. So the, the first idea, how do we make mistakes hard? Well, we first, we have to, to see how those mistakes happen. Uh, there's a whole research area called LangSec. The basic idea of LangSec is to um, treat all of the valid and expected inputs of your program as a language. And then you study that language. You don't have a program that is executing code. Your, your program is a virtual machine. And its input is byte code. Your program is not driven by code, it's driven by data. That's a bit like uh, what the, the previous speaker was talking about with model theoretic. Uh, basically, the data drives the, the program. And there's a large part of theory uh, designed around studying languages, like 
Uh, here is the Chomsky classification of, uh, of grammars. Uh, you may know regular grammars, those that can be passed by regular expressions. Uh, context free, which are basically regular expressions with a stack, so you can do an STD expression. And context sensitive is where it begins to be weird because you have to go back and forth in the data. You depend on things before and after whether what you, where you are. And it gets very hard to, to pass. It, does not, it turns out uh, most of the binary formats are at one point context sensitive. This is annoying. And there's another, another thing to, to see with the, the, the study of languages, uh, like the Turing completeness. So you see that most of your programming language are context-free. Because uh, I, I don't know if there's a language with a regular grammar. Uh, the most context-free. But Turing complete is something else. It, you can design almost any computation in it. Well, what happens if the input language to your program, if the, the file you, put, you pass to, to, you, to your program, the language described is Turing complete? Well, that's an exploit. That's a vulnerability. That's when someone can make your program do almost anything. And that's bad. So we have also uh, some nice principles. Maybe you've heard about Postel's law. So you must be very strict in what you, are, you, you design, what, what you give others. But you have to accept almost anything under the sun. So uh, that was cool when you wanted to have a network that mostly worked. and. Every developer was were, ni were nice people, but uh, it created a lot of issues because you have a lot of different interpretation of how, what a format should be, how it should work, and we have crazy implementations. Basically, whenever there's an ambiguity, whenever there's a choice somewhere, the developer will make a choice. We, we can find those ambiguities right there in the specifications. Like, uh, when you get specification for software, uh, you're always sure that the resulting implementation will completely match the spec, right? Well, that's an issue because some, very often the implementation does not follow the intent of the specification. And most implementations have different issues. And we get some crazy stuff like uh, that schema. So that, that was very interesting that um, Eric Paul, uh, a researcher that uh, made software to infer the state machine of a network uh, protocol and uh, just through the messages that are sent. So this is uh, NSS, uh, an OpenSSL implementation. It's nice and simple. I think the one at the top is OpenSSL. It's a lot more complex because there's the heartbeat and it messes up all of the, the state machine. The one at the right, uh, it's GSSE, a Java implementation of SSL. Uh, there was a nice vulnerability found uh, in there because I don't know if you see it, but the, the dotted line indicates you can bypass all of the certificate verification. Yeah, because they did the, the, um, their state machine as a switch, and the switch uh, the value depending on something in the input. So if you pass, uh, I want the last state, it works. Yeah, so we have issues with ambiguities in how you design formats. What are those ambiguities? Where, where, can, where do we find those errors? So a big source of issues is the, the increasing, increasing the state space. Basically, whenever you have something that uh, grows the different alternatives of how your data can look, uh, it, it will make it harder to, to pass it. Like, you can have optional value, the value is either there or not, and you have to make sure that the, the developer will follow that. Uh, like, uh, you're always sure that when there's a must in an RFC, the developer will do what is designed in the must, or when it's must not, it will not do well. Uh, multiple versions of a specification, uh, negotiation of the version or features when you're talking to a server or client, so that those are big issues in, uh, in TLS. Uh, you can have an, an evolving schema. This happens a lot when you have like a distributed system with a messaging format. And you must, you must update that format to add some values. But not all of your nodes have the, 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 right, uh, 
the right parser for that format because they're not updated at the same time. And at one point, you have a few nodes on version 2 and a lot, lot more at version 10, and maybe they should be comp compatible or not. Or you could have uh, the dynamic schema, like uh, we all use JSON at some point. So schema-less is very fun. It's nice that you use. And it, the problem is it's not when you don't have an explicit schema, it doesn't mean you don't have a schema. It just means you do not know about it. So that's why now with JSON, we're coming back to schema issues like with XML. So those are very big source of ambiguities. But with binary formats, with low level formats, we, we have some very low level bugs that are very fun too. So uh, maybe a lot of you like textual formats. Well, I tend to hate them because I don't know how to parse them correctly. It's, it's very a pain. Uh, in textual formats, most of the time, the data language is the same as the metadata language. It's some kind of ASCII or UTF-8 characters. And this means you have to do escaping. What, how do you do escaping when you have uh, UTF-8 characters? Well, um, there are implementations that take care of that. Most of, do, most of them don't. Like, uh, almost anybody said at some point, yeah, I can write a JSON parser. It's easy. Uh, did you take care of UTF-8? Yeah. Uh, the encoding, there's not, uh, not only the, the car set issues, that kind of stuff. Because when you have a byte, what does it mean? It can be a character. It can be a token to, to separate data. Like, uh, you have CSV, the comma separates data, so the data language is the same as the metadata language, but there's an ASCII character that's used to separate data that almost nobody uses because it's hard to, to write in Vim or that kind of stuff. Because, yeah, we use textual formats because, because we want to edit them in a textual editor. But a byte can also be a bit stream. Like, we have formats with a list of code points, integers stored as a two, three, a five, nine bits. And it's used a lot. And we have that pattern, the length value, uh, which is used a lot in, uh, in binary formats and a lot in streaming. Basically, you have some value, uh, a byte or four bytes or something that will give you an integer and will tell you how much data you will get or how many nodes you want afterwards. So in, in the ID, it's easy. But in practice, it's not. Because uh, anytime you have this, you have to do calculation of the length. And when you do calculation of the length, you have integer overflows and you have vulnerabilities. So we can design formats that avoid those issues. And I hope that at in the next maybe 10 years, people will learn how to build formats. But in the meantime, we have to, to pass real-world formats. And they are context sensitive. They do weird stuff with uh, encoding and escaping. Uh, the, bit length, the, the bit streams, uh, I saw that in, um, in FLAC, in Opus, uh, the, the audio format, in GIF. Well, you, you have uh, bit points of uh, bit codes of very varying length, and they can span multiple bytes. So you never know where you, where, where you are in the stream. That's very annoying. Uh, the length calculations, the big issues, and, and the context sensitivity, and the way formats are done, maybe you have to advance, then go back. Like uh, MP4, there's a big chunk of metadata that, is, uh, that can be at the end of the file or at the beginning. If you want to do streaming, you want it to, have to be at the beginning, otherwise you're not able to pass anything. But, well, you don't know what you will get. No, I think the best practice is to put it at the beginning, but you don't know. We want to make sure that it's easy to pass those formats. So there are issues with memories. There are issues with the way we present data. I have a good tool to work with memory. It's Rust. Because basically, uh, I was a C developer at heart. But there are things I could not do in C. Because I'm, I was too afraid of making a mistake. Uh, I have got that I've crashed on a lot of machines and it was just so terrible because you don't know, you, you can test a lot, but there will be a mistake because the, the compiler does not help you. In Rust, Rust is a language with 
the promise that the, the compiler will help. There are no null pointers. There's some efficient memory management. Um, basically, it emphasizes on security, on safety, and zero cost abstraction. Zero cost abstraction means the compiler will check something at, uh, at compile time, but there's no runtime cost. That's very, very powerful. There, there's a saying, uh, I remember, that with Rust, with the compiler, they want to fix bug classes, not, not bugs. That means if you find a memory bug, you want it to, to be fixed in the compiler. That way, it will be fixed for everybody. And uh, I have seen pieces of code where it compiled at one point, but then the next week, someone found a very weird bug, and everybody has to update its code because, yeah, there was an unsafe pattern that people didn't know about. Managing memory is hard. Uh, so the idea of Rust is to make it easier to do the safe thing. So uh, there's a very powerful borrowing and ownership model. Basically, the compiler knows at any point in time who owns which piece of data. It knows which piece of code, which lexical scope, and which thread owns the data. It's immutable by default. Like uh, most, for most of the data manipulation between threads, you don't need mutexes or that kind of stuff because it's immutable. And you can do mutable data if you want. If you want. There's a lot of typing with there. And it talks very easily to see. So, this fills two of our requirements about memory safety and uh, talking to C. There's a very small data structure that I really like in Rust uh, that's called the slice. Uh, the idea is that you have a pointer to some part of the memory and the length. And uh, it's just, OK, it is a subset of the data at, at that point. The idea I had with this is Maybe I can write zero copy parcels with that kind of data structures. Because basically, uh, I can get a large byte slice as input. And I just want a small part. I won't have to copy it. I will just return pointer to the part I need. So there was this bet that I could write parcels with that kind of stuff. So you have to note, even with Rust, manual parsing will be hard. There are still vulnerabilities. I can write unsafe code in almost any language. So that's why I set out to build NOM, which is a parser combinator library uh, written in Rust with a lot of macros, with lots of magic stuff around the syntax to make sure that uh, writing safe parsers, even in Rust, would be easy. So here's how it looks. Basically, uh, when, whenever you have an identifier and a bang, it means it's a, it's a macro. I use a lot of them because it makes the syntax a lot easier. And well, it, parser combinators are very easy. They're just small functions that you combine between them. And then it, it turns out it's code that really looks like the grammar you want to pass. But with the added benefit that uh, it's very testable, it's very interactive, very easy to write compared to uh, a manual parser where, where you will make a lot of mistakes and there will be a lot of code. And generating parsers from a grammar where uh, it's a pain to maintain. So uh, the magic behind NOM is based on an enum containing three types of values, like done indicates I have a value I was able to pass correctly. And here's the remaining of the input. Uh, an error containing a position information and a custom error type. Or incomplete, just to tell, yeah, we need more data. It's completely generic. You can have anything as input or output type or error R or as error type. We have regular expression parsers. Uh, we have bit stream parsing, the thing I was referring to uh, before, because there was a, a friend that was requesting uh, bit parsing for FLAC, for the, for the format FLAC. And so I set up to work on this. It's very hard to do. But now uh, we have a lot of nice patterns. We have all the usual suspects. So the take, to take a specified number of bytes, many to pass something a certain amount of time, um, a pair of value, something separated like uh, with a comma or, or quote or that kind of stuff. Well, all the stuff you could expect in the parser combinator library. It's zero copy, the thing I was talking about. Well, you have to know that parser combinators traditionally are used the, in functional languages like Scala or Haskell. And they have an issue is that they 
are usually very slow because they tend to copy data run. Well, uh, with Rust, with the zero copy ID, uh, there's a very nice performance boost because basically I never copy anything. I just pass pointers to the data. So how fast is it? Uh, very. Uh, here we have a small comparison about uh, passing an MP4 file. Uh, Hammer is a C parser combinator library. Uh, that's uh, the, basic of, the basis of the LangSec research. Atoparsec is an serial R2 uh, Haskell parser combinator library. Um, so that one uh, was just getting a small part of the file and uh, then, then uh, returning. So none gets a very nice performance boost, but you have to understand there has been, there has been, sorry, there have been almost known optimization in the code. Because this basic idea of using slices to, to avoid copying data made it very fast. Uh, there's another benchmark that's been done a few weeks ago about HTTP parsing. Uh, there was code from uh, Atoparsec, so in Haskell 2. Uh, and the manual C code was the HTTP parser from Giant. I redid all of my benchmark yesterday. Uh, I still find that GNOME is faster, but uh, I don't know why. If someone knows why it can be faster than the, the manual C parser with an explicit state machine that's thousand lines of code compared to, I don't know, that's 300 lines of GNOME, be my guest. Uh, I want to know why it's faster. So I said that I did not optimize much because that was not the point at first. I want to make it easier to write parsers, to, 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 to make those patterns better. So incomplete. It was a part of the, the enum that uh, any, any parser can return. Well, incomplete can contain information about I need that much data, or I need more, more data, but I don't know how. I don't know how much. So like we have the take, take five combinator, which will say, OK, I want five bytes. And if you pass four bytes, you say, I need five bytes. What is it used for? Well, for one of our requirements, that's streaming. Because when you can indicate how much data you need, you can buffer, you can make sure that you, you will get how, may, how much data you, you want. Uh, that's not enough to have incomplete, because usually you want to have a state machine above this. So there's another pattern that comes from the functional world that co that's called the iterity. Uh, but in Rust, I, can, I could not do iterities like uh, Haskell or, or Scala because Rust does not have the tail call optimization, so it, does not, it can, cannot recurse crazily. So it's kind of imperative uh, iterity. It's fast. It's fast, it works well, and it's type safe. And we can compose them very easily. So that, that's a thing that's coming in on now. Uh, another thing that you want to have when you write passes is a way to test them, to debug them, and to make sure they, they, they work correctly. So the first thing, the first tool you need, that you want to see the face of your data. So a hex dump, when you're dealing with binary data, is very useful. But yeah, you can take the hex dump utility, take a look at your file, and then, uh, well, you don't know where you're passing, or no, you don't know where you are in your file. So maybe you want to see that directly in the parser. But, well, there's a combinator in NOM called dbgdmp, where if the underlying, if the child passer returns an error, it will print the error. So the, the, the parser type, like position tag, the position in the input, and then it will show the X dump of that part of the input. That's very powerful, very easy to, to debug a parser that way. The errors returned by, by parsers uh, they contain that enumeration. Yeah, that's a lot of code, but basically it's easy. It's either an error code that can be uh, most any error type, or a code and a position information, or the same the same stuff and a pointer to the next error. Because a parser combinator, it's like a tree. You have the root parser that's calling one child parser that can try a few others, and you, you go into a tree until you get to a leaf, and then you return a value. And if you cannot go to the leaf, you backtrack, you try the next one, etc. 
So maybe you want to, to see where you went to the tree before you, you encounter an error. So um, there's the error macro that uh, comes from uh, Prolog. Uh, if you've done some Prolog, the cut operator. Basically, the idea is that once you go past in the passing tree, once you go past that combinator, you cannot backtrack because you know that you were here for a very good reason. So if you have to backtrack, you stop passing because it's an error. And with this, uh, well, here we, we pass the, the input EFGH blah. So the first tag passer passes EFGH correctly, then passes through uh, the error macro for 42. And then the chain is expecting an AJKL. So it does not work. So the tag will, will return, OK, I got a blah. And that was a tag for AJKL. And the error above catches it, says, OK, I, was, I had the custom error code that was 42, and I got the AFGH blah, blah input. So we have a chain of errors. And you can do arbitrarily long error chains. So it's cool. It's useful. Maybe we can do some uh, advanced stuff with that. The first thing I wanted to do is pattern matching on the uh, error code. Like, I got an error chain with some error codes. And I say, OK, that chain is a specific error message. That's very useful. But there's a big issue with that, is that if I modify my, uh, my grammar, uh, it, it could change the, the, the chain of errors. So that, that makes the error code very hard to, to maintain. So there's another pattern coming from uh, the OCaml world uh, in the many passer system. Uh, the mayor project, the, the idea is that um, even if you modify your grammar, your invalid inputs are still the same. So they pre-generate uh, error chains for non-valid inputs, no, for non-invalid inputs, sorry. And then they can get a, a hash map and say, OK, I, get, I got that error map. This is the, this error message. And it's always up to date. So you can do that in GNOME. That's very easy to do and it's very useful. So we have position information. We have uh, which parser gave which error. Um, we have hex dump. Maybe we can do some fun stuff. Well, here I can get a colored output in the xdump saying, OK, this is that part of the parser that got that part of the input, and the errors come, come from there. That was like uh, one hour of code, and it was very really fun to do. Uh, that kind of stuff is very interactive and help, helps a lot in developing the parser. Because you cannot write your grammar at once and say, OK, I'm done. It's working. No, you have to test with a lot of files. You have to see what piece of data comes at what part of the, your passing tree. And you have to, to verify everything. You have to debug everywhere. So all of those patterns make it a lot more useful to a lot more make it easier to write parsers. So the promise was that it should be usable. So is it? Well, there are a lot of existing projects now. Uh, Norm is about uh, one year old. And uh, I think there's on GitHub like uh, 50 projects I can see using Norm. Uh, a few uh, textual formats like ini, libconfig, CSV. Uh, FastQ is um, uh, genetic data stuff. Uh, ISO 8601 is, is date. IRC, uh, Linux slash info. A few binary formats like tar, pcap, uh, gif, flac, uh, messaging formats. And there's uh, this small company that you may know about. Uh, they've been investigating Rust for some time. And uh, they've used Norm for log the uh, parsing code and for an HTTP parser. Uh, and they, they've done that for a long time. Uh, they say it was very, very stable. When I was just uh, in the code, I said, OK, nothing is stable. It's crashing all the time. How can they use it in, how can they use it in production? But it works. It's, it's very, very powerful, very fast. So to sum up, we have a parser combinator library that's fast. That's written in a memory-safe language. There's no runtime cost like a garbage collection or something like that. It's compatible with C code. We have a lot of nice tools. And it makes a lot of stuff safe. And 
I don't say that just because I have those tools. I tried, I, I put it in a further, I, tr I tried to see how can we could reverse engineering the stuff. Basically, uh, whenever uh, further finds an issue, like um, I used the uh, American FuzzyDop, whenever it finds an issue, it's not in the parser combinator stuff, it's when I'm writing code by hand, like uh, I said earlier, when I want to calculate length by hand. Okay, there's an overflow there, you're done. So, most of the stuff that the norm does, it would be safer than anything any, anyone could write in a parser. So, you can find it on GitHub. Uh, there's a cargo crate, uh, that those are the packages in Rust. Um, the slides will be avail available after the conference. The benchmarks, uh, you can find them there. If you have ideas on how to improve the Haskell or, or C solutions, or if you want to add other parsers, be my guest. It's interesting to see how different solutions stand, even if uh, it's not for being the fastest in the world, just see the, the, the ballpark. And uh, if you want stickers from Clever Cloud, we have a very nice one. Do you have any questions about NUM? Uh, yes, very, very often someone comes with uh, a use case, a type of format that I do not know how to handle in NUM, and then uh, well, I get to work and uh, I implement it. Right now I'm mostly an advisor for people using NUM. Uh, I, I write less formats, more tools for people to use it. And uh, because everybody has some weird use case to support. Uh, you had a question? I'm just saying, what? How much unsafe is the thing? Uh, the question is, how much unsafe is uh, is NOM? If it if it is, well, basically, uh, no, that's not that wasn't the question. Sorry. Yeah. That that's the question. Okay. So uh, basically, whenever you have to write stuff by hand, like I said, context sensitive stuff. Uh, taking a value and doing a shift or some other data, that kind of stuff, isn't safe. And you have to know that the parser is not the end game. It's the thing that takes uh, raw data, raw bytes, and makes some structured stuff. But um, I talked about context sensitive, uh, context free, and regular grammar. Well, your programming languages are context free. They have a context free grammar. But if you want to model the whole language that Turing complete, uh, with a grammar, you get you got something that's highly context sensitive, because the grammar is not the the only thing. You have the state machine above this, and I'm working on the making state machine safer too. But uh, I have nothing that I can publish right now that's very useful. Anything else? Does anyone want to write some weird formats? Sorry? Can you parse the HTML4 with it? Uh, can I parse HTML4 with it? Probably. Uh, that would be probably very annoying to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, all of the textual formats, you, you have to do some tokenizing part with lexing and then reparsing. And that's very annoying to do because why put spaces every, everywhere? That's, oh, yes, that's to make it easier to edit and read. Well. You, you, we should have text editor that handles structured data instead of aligning stuff with tabs or spaces or whatever. That's not the job of the developer, that should be the job of a machine. Yes? Uh, how about formats that are bit oriented, like bit streams instead of byte oriented? So the question is uh, how about formats that are bit stream, uh, that bit oriented? Well, I showed, um, I think I have it somewhere. Tick, tick, tick. Yeah, bitstream parsing. So this works. Uh, we can have uh, a take, take for a specified number of bits, or a tag, or uh, a, a different patterns, and this works. Uh, I developed it because someone needed it in, the, in a flag decoder. I think there are about two implementations of flag with norm. I don't know which one will, will, uh, will win, but uh, let's see. 
Any other questions? Yes? You can. Uh, the question is, what if I want to, to copy the, the input instead of zero copy? Well, you can. Uh, you can copy the content of a slice and return a vector. That's not an issue. So um, how much time do I have? 10 minutes? OK. Uh, do you want to see uh, a real-world parser in NOM? Yeah. Uh, let's see, um, oh yes, uh, a good one should be, um, uh, let me see, uh, a good one should be the, the, the one, the, the, the HTTP benchmark. Uh, where can I get it there? No, okay. Uh, okay, that's right. And just uh, remove this. Where where is my mouse? Okay. Okay. No, it was not this one. Uh, so, in num, yes. So, uh, we have a few structures. Like uh, I said, uh, I could do zero copy. Uh, the method URI on version in the input are just slices. So, that's why there's the quote A. It indicates a lifetime. And that way, I can say the lifetime of that structure depends of the, on the lifetime of the input. That's, that means I cannot deallocate the input until I deallocated the, the, the request, because otherwise it would point to something that's invalid. Yes? Oh, a, bit, a bit bigger, yeah. Is it right? At the, the end of the room, that's right too? OK. So we have a few structures. So request, header, um, well, that's the annoying function to check if something is token. Well, th th there was a, um, a real um, uh, a big debate in the Rust community for that, because uh, there was a solution that was using uh, iterators. And you go through the data, and you see, oh, is, is that in that string of uh, different tokens that should be uh, invalid? And that was painfully slow. And then I wrote that. And people were wondering, no, it should not be faster. Well, I was just saying that should be easier on the CPU. Let's go with it, and it was faster. Yeah. So, um, where am I? OK. So, uh, you have a few functions to check if something is landing a space, that kind of stuff. And then we have a list of functions. We have line ending that tests if it's ever a line feed or the, the carrier return. Uh, we have um, the request line function that takes an input with a specific lifetime and gives out an output with that lifetime. And it's a chain. It will try to pass something that is a token and get as much, as much token as it can, then spaces, then something that's not a space, that's unreal, and then spaces and get the version afterward. So this is a way to, to chain a list of parcels. It's very easy to do. And Afterwards, it builds the request with method URI version. So this is for the first line of the HTTP parsing. Very easy to do. Um, to check the version, that was what I was showing before, get a tag, HTTP, because you know it's there and you want, don't want to get the data. It's just metadata. You, you know you're passing HTTP once you, you got there. But you want to get the version, and then you get uh, a slice of the input. Take while, we check. OK, I have, a version, um, I have tokens that can be in a version, and I get the, the longest slice that can uh, contain them. The message header, well, you have horizontal space, then the header. Um, that, oh, sorry, that's the value, the, part, the value part of the header, so uh, after the column. 
and then you have how to pass a header line with a, a token, then a colon, then a few values. And you can get a uh, header will contain a vector of values. So you can also allocate stuff. Uh, you, you have to. But um, there's an interesting optimization. There's one of the parcels where if you know how much you will get at the end, it will not return a vector that's allocated on the heap and that can grow uh, in time. It will pre-allocate uh, an array that's large enough because it knows how much it needs. And what's next? Yeah. Uh, well, the request is a request line and the message header and the line ending. And afterwards, it's the, the parsing. And I will go through the files and uh, I have a few benchmarks. So to see the difference, um, the C versions, uh, what do I have? It's, yeah, in HTTP parser. No, it's another score, OK. So that one, there's, there are a lot of uh, ideas about how to make stuff faster with C macros. Well, uh, Rust macros are a lot more powerful than C macros. Uh, that's uh, a lot more useful. And uh, where's the, the meat of the... Uh, uh, like, OK. So here's how it's done in, uh, in that parser. There's a big switch. And whenever you encounter a token, that means you can pass to the next state. You hit the, the switch and you, you loop on this. And it, there are go-tos everywhere. And uh, we already had line, uh, we have 2,000, but uh, I think, yeah, 2,500 lines for the, the C, C, the password version, and then the header and everything. It's a very large piece of code. It's very hard to do correctly. And well, I can guarantee that it could go even faster than this once I implement SIMD passing uh, in NUM. But I don't need to. It's already fast enough. It's in the same, uh, the same latency, the same, the same kind of, uh, of timing. So why, why should I care? I have a safe parser that's easy to write, easy to maintain, and that's fast enough and can be embedded in C and everything. So that, that's why I'm working a lot with them right now. And I hope you, you will too. So thank you for coming. And uh, you can go talk to me uh, if you need to, to, to write a parser, if you want to, to talk about how to handle data or share stories about which weird format you had to, to handle at some point. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>